What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. As most of y'all's drafts are wrapping up, we need to look towards the future. It's not all about draft season. We harp and harp and harp on who we're going to pick all summer long, right? I do analysis for three or four months on who to draft, when to draft them, strategies about drafting, but the regular season starts, and that's more important than the draft. After one week, one week of play, right? Someone gets 20 carries that wasn't expected to get 20 carries, and ADPs go out the door. ADPs do not matter after week one. You got to understand that. The rest of the season is how you win. Waiver wire pickups, trading, these kind of things. So now that drafts are in the books, it's actually Monday right now, so my E-Town Get Down draft is tonight, which means the vlog will go up in a couple days. I know a lot of you guys love that shit, so that will be up in a couple days. But it's time to start looking forward. So today I'm going to be looking at my top trade targets. Uh, a couple of them are guys trading away who I think might get off to a hot start and you should sell high. A couple of them are buy low guys who I think will get off to a slow start and thus you could buy them on the low low. So let's get into the video and uh, and yeah, that's, uh, that's it. Before we jump right into the video, I think I figured out my in-season content schedule. I think what I'm going to do is Tuesday, put out a waiver wire video. Thursday, put out my top DFS plays for the week, along with like wide receiver cornerbacks and some sit starts, things like that. And then Saturday will be just Q&As, so questions from y'all. So what I need you guys to do is to join my Facebook group. It is an open, public Facebook group. It's just Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. I will link that down below. The way to submit a question, and I will be answering, I don't know, a handful of questions, maybe 8, 10, 12 however long it takes and however much time I put into it I will be answering questions straight from you guys so you need to go to the big dogs got to eat fantasy football Facebook page either write a question in the group or send me a message it will say like send message to the actual group or the page or whatever so it sends directly to me and at the end of it I want you to hashtag answer my damn question that's how I know you'll be submitting it for the Saturday Q&A fan submitted question so go to the Facebook page you can either post the question on the page and I want this to be an interactive page you guys can jump in on each other stuff and answer each other's questions post question in there on the page or do it through Facebook Messenger so once you go to the page you'll see send a message you can send it to me either one you do at the end of it I want you to hit that with hashtag answer my damn question all right that's how I know you're submitting it because you've seen this but those are for Saturday's videos today we're talking about top early season trade targets probably weeks one to four one to five something like that and the first guy we're gonna get into is someone getting drafted pretty highly right now that is Jordan Howard running back of the Chicago Bears he is a buy low guy for me. He is someone that I could see struggling out of the gate. Um, his early season schedule is not extremely friendly. And when you take a first glance at it, you might think otherwise, right? It's Green Bay, Seattle, Arizona, Tampa Bay. However, Green Bay, Arizona, and Tampa Bay are all very, 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 very good run defenses. They were good last year and uh, have probably improved going into 2018. Uh, Green Bay is on the road. Arizona is also on the road. Seattle is probably the mismatch here, but the thing is for Howard, he's one of those backs that you're probably going to need pretty good game script in order for him to see the high volume of uh, rushing attempts that he saw last year. So um, while Seattle might be a good matchup, I'm not exactly sure he gets that game script for Chicago. Uh, a, lo a lot of it depends on if Trubisky plays well or not, right? If he does come out and kind of ball out, then they could take that lead on Seattle early. But let's break it down game by game. Week one, they start out with Green Bay. They're on the road at Green Bay. Now, uh, Green Bay graded out as the number one overall run defense per pro football focus in the NFL entering 2018. So they make uh, a grading sheet entering the 2018 season. And Green Bay is currently their number one ranked run defense. They graded out last year as Football Outsiders number eight overall run defense per their DVOA. They allowed just 3.9 yards per carry to opposing running backs last year. It's a tough matchup for Howard. And the worst part is basically what I just covered on the game script. Uh, Packers are like nine point, or I think eight, eight point favorites in this one. And the Packers are at home. So what I'm seeing here is not a great game script for Jordan Howard. The Packers could get up pretty big, and I would see this maybe skewing more towards a Tariq Cohen game than a Jordan Howard game because things could get out of hand pretty quickly. So week one is something I'm a little worried about. Week two, like I said, they're at home against Seattle, so there's not much to say here. Uh, Howard might have a very good game here. Not really putting this as like a buy low candidate game. You're not going to want to try to buy him after the Seattle game because he might actually have a good game. But week three, they're on the road. Again, you can't underestimate being on the road, guys. That's actually a three-point swing when you're talking about Vegas lines. So if you're in a neutral 
uh, game field, if you're at a neutral field, then the line will not shift whatsoever. But one team's at home, they're getting three points on the line. If one team's away, they're getting minus three points on the line. So it's a six-point swing when you go from home to away. Um, so they're on the road at Arizona. Uh, another team that's been a very good run defense. They were last year, and Arizona's pretty much been a good run defense for the majority of like this past decade. They were our, they were Football Outsiders' number one overall ranked run defense in 2017 per Football Outsiders DVOA. They ranked third in the NFL in yards per carry to opposing backs, like the third fewest. They allowed just 3.5 yards per carry. They were one of four teams in the NFL last year to not allow a run of more than 37 yards. Uh, of more than 37 yards. Um, and they allowed the third lowest rushing first down percentage in the NFL last year. So they were very good at making sure big plays didn't happen. They were very good at stopping short yardage plays. Like I'm saying, they're the lowest percentage of first downs. Um, and these are where Jordan Howard can kind of exploit defenses. And these are just this is just a tough uh, run defense overall. They also lost one of their best run-stopping defenders early in the season last year, Marcus Golden, uh, who tore his ACL in Week 4. He's supposed to be back and ready to go. He was the... Um, he had the fourth highest run stop percentage among linebackers in 2016, which was his breakout year where he had 12 and a half sacks. So he was a big piece of this defense and they missed out on him and still played well last year. So getting him back is a big boost in my opinion. Um, so they got a game on the road against a stiff run defense, which doesn't excite me for Jordan Howard purposes. Again, probably a game where a pass catching back might do better than uh, a guy like Jordan Howard. Week four, they get Tampa Bay who on paper, again, you might think as, uh, as an easy opponent, but the one part of their defense which should be heavily improved and should be good in 2018 is their run defense. Like I said before, for the Packers, Packers were number one per PFF entering 2018. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers are the fifth ranked defense per pro football focus as a run defense entering 2018. They add their first round pick, Vita Villa, to the mix, who is uh, one of the best run stopping defensive linemen in this year's draft class. So that was like a piece of... Um, the rookie class that they saw was inevitable or they saw was going to be a big piece of their future and what they wanted to do on defense and that was stop the run. So they added Vita Villa. Um, they already have two great run stopping defenders in, in the front seven in Levante David and Quan Alexander. And then they went and got Jason Pierre-Paul, Vinny Curry, Bo Allen, and Mitch Unrain who is, uh, I believe he's starting the year on PUP, or if he's on injured reserve. Mitch Unrain was actually a very, very, very good run-stopping defensive interior lineman, but unfortunately he's injured. They did add a bunch of other pieces, though. So the San Bay Buccaneers' defense is going to be much different than the one they had in 2017. I think it's going to be much improved. So this, again, is not an easy matchup for Jordan Howard. The game script might be there. This should probably be a close game, if anything. Uh, Jameis Winston should be back for week four. They're not naming him the starter yet, but I would be shocked if he wasn't the starter when he actually came back. Uh, in week four. So uh, Jordan Howard, again, does not have an easy matchup there. So three of the first four matchups, while they don't seem very difficult, are actually pretty tough on paper. So Jordan Howard might struggle pretty pretty heavily out of the gate. And what I think is even more of a buy low situation here is their fifth week is actually their bye week. Um, so now you're getting possibly three bad games and then a bye week. So I think that's easier to convince the owner. It's like, oh, you're not going to be able to use them for another week. And that's kind of when you get in there and try to uh, make that trade for Jordan Howard. So he's someone that, you know, I'm not going to be mad if I end up drafting him in the third round because the volume should be there. Uh, but it would probably be better if you um, were able to trade for him. And then after their week five bye, they take on Miami, who will probably be a very poor run defense. Um, they were like average middle of the pack last year, horrible pass defense. Now they lose and Dominican Sue, of course, to the Rams. So that middle of the line should be wide open in Miami. So he should be uh, he should be ready to roll after that week five bye, which is when you should have traded for him. Second guy on this list is a wide receiver. On the 49ers, Marquise Goodwin. And the reason he's on this list is because he has such a hard schedule to start out the year. Um, he, he faces off against some of the top cornerbacks in the NFL, uh, ones I expect to go one-on-one -on -one with him in coverage. I was, I was working on my wide receiver cornerback matchup sheet for this week, for week one. And last year in the NFL, there were only, uh, I think it was six teams that had their top cornerback shadow the top wide receiver in at least half of their games. So eight or more games, there was only six NFL teams that shadowed the top uh, wide receiver. And of Marquise Goodwin's five, the first five weeks, he plays four of those guys that, that were shadowed. So four of the cornerbacks of the entire NFL, right? There's only six teams that shadowed. Four of them he faces off in the first four weeks. They are week one, 
at Minnesota, at the Vikings, Xavier Rhodes, he was one of them. Week two, plays the Lions, Darius Slay. Week three, they go at Kansas City, the Chiefs. That's probably his only easy matchup. Week four, he's at the Chargers. Casey Hayward, the number one overall ranked PFF cornerback last year. Week five, he plays the Cardinals, Patrick Peterson. So ironically, um, there are not a lot of teams that use shadow coverage, and Marquise Goodwin gets four of the six teams that did in his first five weeks. Um, three of those five games are on the road at Vikings, at Chiefs, at Chargers. So the one easy game he has at the Chiefs is the one game on the road. Um, the other thing is these cornerbacks, obviously, they're all really, really, really good. They've played very well over the last few years. They're highly rated per PFF and whatnot. They're all pretty fast, too. So Goodwin is a guy who is a field stretcher, as well as he should operate as a wide receiver one. But like his calling card is the fact that he runs a 4 2 7 40, right? He's a guy who can get deep. He can get far past the defenses, right? Uh, unfortunately, you're playing against some of these cornerbacks who are also very, very, very fast. So Casey Hayward on this list is the only guy who's running um, worse than a 4 4 5 40, and it's like 4 4 7. And he more than makes up for it with his technique because, like I said, he was the number one graded cornerback per pro football focus last year. So Goodwin is going to see a heavy, heavy dosage of Xavier Rhodes, Darius Slay, Casey Hayward, Patrick Peterson over the first five weeks of the season. That's really, really, really tough. And got, uh, Goodwin's a guy that I really like this year in this offense, and I really expect him to be the number one, but just not to start the year. Um, when it's said and done, he will be, I think, the top target here, and I think he will eat the most out of any of the pass catchers on this team. Uh, but people who draft him, you're going to be really hesitant to play him uh, over those first five weeks. And after the Cardinals, they play the Packers. So the, the schedule gets a lot easier. They play the Packers, who, again, were horrible against the pass last year. They did bring on these two new cornerbacks, um, Josh Jackson and uh, uh, I can't think of the other guy off the top of my head. But they're bringing the two stud cornerbacks. Um, but that's not going to be like a, a 180 turn for, for the Packers. Still a much easier matchup than the other guys that they've been, that Goodwin's going to have been playing over the first five weeks of the season. And... Uh, what else do we got here? So they do have to play the Rams and the Cardinals after Green Bay, but then after that, they get the Raiders, the Giants, the Bucks, and the Seahawks over their next four games. So I kind of like Goodwin to explode here over those next four weeks. So he's someone who, if he can't produce over the first half of the season, people start getting down on him. As long as his snap percentages and his snap counts are there among the wide receiver ones in the NFL and he's getting, you know, he's a full-time player, expect him to uh, start producing once that string of, you know, Raiders, Giants, Bucks, Seahawks games start going like week, I think that's a week like eight or nine or something like that. So he's someone that you could buy uh, later on in the season, but don't get discouraged or, you know, just, just don't be surprised if he struggles mightily over the first portion of the season, guys. Okay, so the next guy on this list is another running back. And this is Carlos Hyde of the Cleveland Browns. And I made like a tweet thread basically of middle middle round running backs that I'm getting a lot of questions on. Like, do I like this guy? Should I pick him as my RB2? And it's like, it's like the uh, Carlos Hyde, Marshawn Lynch, Chris Carson, all guys that I like, but certainly have a high, high risk probability along with them. And Carlos Hyde is a sell high guy for me. Um, and this isn't so much about the schedule as it is just the overall situation. My problem with Hyde is just that the hype and redraft, I think, is getting too high for me, where we're seeing Hyde picked as early as the fifth round, usually like the sixth round in redraft leagues. And he's looked great in preseason. He's dominated the snaps with the first team. He's produced. Right? His stat lines are, are there. Um, the line has looked great. And it's obviously a much improved team overall. However, this is a team that, of course, is going to get a lot of hype with all the changes, with being on hard knocks and all that stuff. At the end of the day, guys, they still have literally the lowest over-under total per Vegas. They are still projected to win five and a half games. That's the over-under. So they are still projected to be the worst team in the NFL. So do you know what that means? That means that they have a pass catching back on this team that will play a lot of snaps. His name is Duke Johnson. He's not going anywhere. So Carlos Hyde is going to be operating as the early down back here, of course, but they are still projected to be a five and a half win team. And if you're reasonably expecting them to win eight, nine, 10 games, I think you're naive and I think you're a little bit out of your mind. Um, six games, if you hit the over, you have to be kind of excited as a Browns fan, to be honest with you. To go from 1-31 and 31 to winning six games to hopefully the next year, 9 or 10, and competing for a playoff spot. But for right now, I think the hype has gotten a little bit too much. Duke Johnson is still going to be the pass catching back here. He's still going to be operating in two-minute drills. So I could so I could totally see Hyde being like a Jordan Howard type this year. But Jordan Howard doesn't have a competing back behind him. They don't. He doesn't have a back who this team invested early second-round capital in. And, of course, I'm talking about Nick Chubb. So Nick Chubb, you take a look at him. Nick Chubb is the guy that the Browns, like I said, used a 
early round pick, a second round pick. He's a prospect out of Georgia. His combine was amazing. He probably would have been the most hyped prospect coming out of school had it not been for Saquon Barkley, as you see, a 98th percentile spark score, 87th percentile yards per carry. His 40-yard dash put him in the 89th percentile for weight-adjusted speed score, 91st percentile burst score. His bench press is crazy as well. And they used that second round pick on him. And that was after signing Carlos Hyde in free agency. So you could see that they weren't sold on Carlos Hyde and they loved Nick Chubb. They wouldn't have signed Carlos Hyde for this $15 million and then signed Nick Chubb if they didn't see a heavy future with Nick Chubb or if they didn't see something possibly going wrong with Carlos Hyde. Now, again, Carlos Hyde owns his backfield to start the year. There's no doubt in my mind about that. My problem is how long can you expect them to sit on Nick Chubb? Um, I'm gonna guess Hyde is probably in for like 15 plus touches uh, in terms of a workload for September. And that, again, depends on game scripts. If they get down early, Hyde is not going to be the guy who is in the hurry-up mode, who is in pass catching and, and catch-up mode for the Browns. I think Nick Chubb will get a handful of touches to start the year, maybe three, four, five carries uh, in the beginning, and then eventually start to chip away at the backfield split here between him and Hyde. Uh, there's also one other thing that concerns me, which is probably more of a reach and not really like a big deal for me but it's a possibility of a quarterback change right we have no idea what's actually going to happen here obviously they keep saying Tyrod's a starter and he wants him to play for the full 16 games um, now you might not think it's a big downgrade from Tyrod to Baker Mayfield but any unexpected quarterback change in the middle of the year is going to be probably a negative thing for an offense uh, it also takes away from all the running backs in this backfield in my opinion now Baker's obviously a good athlete right and he's someone who can uh, move the defense around and can make plays with his feet, but he's nowhere near the uh, mobility. He has nowhere near the mobility of a guy like Tyrod Taylor, right? So when you have a guy like Tyrod, that obviously opens up the defense. And we, this is a theory that we've been harping on as fantasy analysts for a long time now, for years. And you just look at it and it's, these guys with the mobile quarterbacks, running backs are... Um, their numbers always boost up. And we saw Lamar Miller with Deshaun Watson last year. We've seen it with Alfred Morris, Shady with Tyrod, like all these things, right? Because the quarterback's obviously mobile, meaning one of the linebackers has to keep an eye on him. So the running back's pretty much playing 10 on 11 when running the ball. There's a lot more open lanes when you have a mobile quarterback. So if Tyrod's out of the game, this is a hit for all running backs. I'm not just saying this for uh, only Carlos Hyde, but overall, I just don't think it's good. So, um, you know, it, it, again, it's much less of a c concern for me because I'm not sure the quarterback change is even going to happen, but it's still, you know, it's just still something to keep in mind or it's still kind of like a red flag that might happen. So what I think would be a good idea is to look at some of these rookie running backs, not Nick Chubb though, um, these other rookie running backs around the league who might work their way into uh, a bigger workload as the year progresses. So I think Carlos Hyde starts off hot, right? I think he, um, I, I think he's going to see a bigger workload in the beginning of the year. Like I said, I think like 15 touches probably a game. Uh, people might get high on him and be like, oh, you know, Hyde's got like a really nice workload going on here. And they might not think about a quarterback change or they might not think about Nick Chubb getting more involved or they might not think about the game scripts that are still going to happen with Cleveland. And then you look at the guys like, I think like Royce Freeman over the first month or Carryon Johnson would might, might be a perfect kind of flip and switch scenario, even if you need to throw in like a lower end wide receiver along with Carlos side to get one of those guys because I think Royce Freeman, although he was just named the starter, like that that doesn't shouldn't surprise anyone. Um, I don't see Freeman or Carryon Johnson completely taking over their respective backfields until maybe a month or two months into the season. Um, and if you can miss out on the beginning part where they're splitting touches and they're hard to predict on a week to week basis in redraft leagues. Uh, that that is super valuable because you'll get Carlos Hyde getting a lot of touches and then when you think that Chubb is probably going to work his way into the lineup more and more then you trade for a carry on Johnson or then you trade for a Royce Freeman who will continue seeing his touch count go up and up and up because I think these players are super efficient and efficiency leads to volume and you want to buy low on those guys um, right before they start hitting their like workhorse workloads there. So those are two guys I would keep in mind for a trade. Um, you want to look at these rookie running backs who this is like something we see every year. The guys who get super hyped and then they don't play much in the beginning of the year and you see their workload come on and on and on bigger and bigger as the year progresses. Um, so those that's someone I would I would look to to flip for Hyde. All right, these are kind of my early season trade targets. So we have Jordan Howard, buy low, Marquise Goodwin, I guess buy low as well. I just think he's going to start off really, really slow. So you might want to buy him after the first like six weeks. And then Carlos Hyde is a sell high guy. So those are my top three guys right now I would be looking to involve in some sort of trade later down the line. And again, guys, anything could happen. So these might be irrelevant like three weeks into the season. Um, but this is just what I'm seeing into the future. You know, I got to rub my crystal ball a little bit. My man's Hector. 
and see what we got. So if you enjoyed the video, make sure you give a thumbs up. If you want your question answered, it could be sit start, it could be trade topics, it could be really anything you want. Commissioner, you know, questions that you got for me, make sure you submit it through my Facebook group, Big Dogs BDGE Fantasy Football. I will link that down below and maybe I will choose y'all. I'll probably choose somewhere between eight and 12 questions and answer them on Saturday's video. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. I'll be doing videos like this every single week. If you're listening via podcast, please leave a rating and review. I work very hard on these videos and it lets me know that you appreciate them and you want them to continue coming. So thank you all for joining me um, and I will see you on Thursday. Peace.